Good morning. Welcome to worship as we gather this Sunday with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is always a good gift that God gives to us when we come around His Word and share in the gift of the sacrament. This day we gather, uh, you'll see things are a little different of color today. They're red. We celebrate the feast of St. James the Lesser, the first of the apostles to uh, offer his life as witness and in martyrdom uh, for the love of his God in Christ. We gather today and uh, give thanks to God for the memory of the saints who have gone before us, the lives they live, and the ministries they share. Friends, I invite you to rise then this day as we begin our time of worship with the order for confession and absolution in our yellow forms. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, who is given to die for and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a fellow ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, our gathering in today is in number 424 in our hymnal, in 424. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Gracious God, we remember this day your servant, the Apostle James, the first among the twelve to be martyred for the name of Jesus. Pour out on all who give leadership and guidance to your church that same spirit of self-denying service, which is the true mark of authority. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be reading from Acts. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and thought through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judah. Here, this they did 
sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw this, that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Friends, I invite you to rise. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise Lord. Lord. Please be seated. Good morning, friends. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. This morning, as we gather together, we do so on the feast of St. James the Apostle. St. James was a part of one of the sets of brothers who followed Jesus. He and his brother John were considered the sons of thunder, and they found themselves privy to some very important moments in the life of Jesus, such as being present on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Peter. James is also one of the disciples of Jesus, whose folly has been captured for all time through the witness of the scriptures. We read together in our gospel of James and John's desire to gain power and status from their connection to Jesus, as they asked to be seated at his right and left hand in glory. At this point in the gospel, they seem to follow Jesus not totally because of their love for him, but because of the benefits they see him being able to provide them in the future. But then in our reading from Acts, we see James martyred for his faith by King Herod. In this, we recognize that something significant has changed. No longer is James seeking his own throne, but now he stands defiantly and in utter fidelity to Christ as the deadly power of Herod's throne is unleashed upon him. St. James, in his death, becomes the first of the apostles to offer their life as a sacrifice to Christ. He is the foremost of the great leaders of the early church to pay for their faith with their life. And today, we honor and remember his sacrifice by adorning our space with the color red. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at the martyrs with a certain sense of awe. Their devotion to the faith is incredibly powerful and they lived in times of turbulence and violence where people sought to take their life simply because they worshipped Christ. Yet, with the whole world against them and the threat of this life being cut short, they clung all the tighter to Christ. Friends, I find myself simply amazed, inspired, and humbled by the witness of the martyrs. Sometimes, Christians were martyred because they made a nuisance of themselves as they called leaders to standards of morality that were not welcome or desired. 
This was the case of St. John Chrysostom, who preached from a pulpit overlooking the congregation. But above him and off to the side was a box in which the empress sat and looked down on him. St. Chrysostom would regularly turn away from the congregation, preaching just to the empress when the scriptures seemed especially pertinent to her role as a leader. This led to him being sent away and exiled as he was marched around in miserable weather until his body finally gave out. Sometimes martyrs were made because there were lines that Christians simply could not cross. During the persecutions of Emperor Diocletian, envoys were sent into communities throughout the Roman Empire and all citizens were called to attend. They were given a bit of incense to offer and sacrifice to the emperor and then they were offered a bit of meat that had been sacrificed to the Roman gods. Now this for many was actually a great delight as meat was not a regular staple on the dinner plate of most folks. It would be kind of like rewarding someone with a nice reception of hors d'oeuvres at the springs after they pledged themselves to someone's cause. Those who offered the sacrifice and ate the meat were then given a note indicating that they had indeed sacrificed. The Christians who refused not, who refused to do this, not only gave up the delights of rich food, but they also risked various punishments and persecutions as well. Not because they did any sort of wrong, but because their faith drew a line that they could not cross. And sometimes, Christians were simply killed because they made good scapegoats, like when Emperor Nero blamed a series of fires in Rome on the Christians and proceeded to place blame and punishment squarely on their shoulders. And yet, in all of these instances, our predecessors held fast to their beloved. They turned their eyes, their hopes, their everything to Christ, and they endured all that their enemies could bring upon them. Again, as I look at the martyrs, I am amazed, inspired, and humbled. But I quickly feel quite distant from them as well. The martyrs endured and suffered so much, but I cannot say this about myself. I live comfortably. I live with a general feeling of safety. I have the same opportunities and privileges as anyone else, and while today some may scoff at my open worship of God, no one is threatening my life for the sake of the faith that I hold. I can be in awe of the martyrs, but how can I really relate to them when their lives were so full of suffering and mine so full of safety and comfort? Dr. Chris Hall offers a perspective that's helped me greatly with this struggle, for he urges us to focus less on the suffering of the martyrs and more on what caused that suffering to come about. Because the central struggle of the martyrs was not actually one of suffering at all. It was one of allegiance. Ultimately, the martyrs lost their lives because of who they gave their allegiance to. Suffering was simply a consequence of that allegiance. Now, I may not know incredible suffering, but I can definitely relate to things competing and calling for my allegiance. How often do advertisements encourage me to make an idol of myself, no longer seeking the treasures of heaven or the good of my neighbor, but every comfort, pleasure, and amenity that I can gather for myself right here and right now? Have not politics become a predominant religion of our day, with many placing their complete hope and trust no longer in God or in the works and promises of Christ, but in systems run by human beings just as fallible as you and I? Doesn't cultural propaganda weigh on us daily, urging us to abandon age-old understandings and practices of our faith and identity, threatening to slap us with appalling labels and slander if we don't? Are there not a million commitments demanded of us from work, sports, hobbies, clubs that call us towards genuinely good things, but also sometimes so gobble up our calendars that there is no longer any room for any sort of regular and faithful practice? Friends, we may not live in a time where we experience the physical suffering of the martyrs, but we absolutely understand what it means to have our allegiance tugged and pulled on from a million different directions at the same time. And while our struggles may not face the obstacle of pain, they do have their challenges, too. In our day, the slow drift of shifting allegiances from one place to another can be more dangerous than a clear line in the sand kind of confrontation. I believe our struggle is often much more like falling asleep in a raft and not realizing that we're gently drifting out to sea. If we're not alert, our allegiances can shift without ever knowing what has happened. And I believe they do. Thankfully, though, 
We have a God who is with us through these struggles, whatever shape they may take. We see in our scriptures this morning how a selfish and frustrating disciple could change. James once was looking to milk his association with Jesus for all the power and grandeur that it could possibly produce. He saw Jesus as a path to his own throne. But then in Acts, we see him cast aside his desires for a throne. He even bears the fury of someone else's throne because his heart has now been made different than what it was. Now, James clings to Christ and feels the victory of God, even as his own life is struck from him. In the martyrs, we see the strength of God shining forth from their magnificent example. And I believe in our lives today, God is with us too. He certainly calls us to obedience and to constantly return to him, but he doesn't leave us to do it on our own. He strengthens us through his grace. He energizes and encourages us in the Eucharist. And when we misstep and mess up, he has given us our baptism as a constant reminder that we are his children. And even when we fall away, our Father will never stop calling us home. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray for Christ's holy Church, for the nations of the world, and for our brothers and sisters throughout creation. We pray for the church that God will continue to raise up servant -like leaders like St. James, who will witness to the truth and the hope of the good news we know in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all who are persecuted for the faith, that their witness may not be in vain but inspire us to grow in deeper and more abiding faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all the apostles, for all our brothers and sisters in the faith who are sent to share the faith with others, that they will proclaim the gospel with grace and by their witness, welcome others into the fellowship of the church. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all the baptized, especially Gibson Grace, that washed and welcomed into, into the fellowship of the church, she may grow in faith, hope, and love throughout her days. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving the dedication of those who supported the construction of this very house of worship some 150 years ago. Like them, May we continue to gather in this sacred place to offer our worship and prayers and graciously welcome our neighbors as Christ has welcomed us to share in our ministries of faith, hope, and love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
We pray for those who govern the towns, cities, states, and nations of the world, that they may be blessed with a discerning mind, be agents of encouragement and renewal, and seek dialogue and peace where there is strife. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are suffering from droughts and storms, from heat and fire, from flooding and other disasters, that the earth might be blessed with weather which sustains life, that all who suffer may know comfort, and that those who give aid might do, do so with gr generosity. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for communities and for all who remain at risk and vulnerable to the increasing spread of COVID, that they may trust in the gra gracious work of God, who inspires good and useful knowledge, enlightening researchers, and raising up those in caring professions to be a blessing to his people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the grace to stand firm in the faith when tempted to turn away from that which is right and true, that the Spirit will be our strength and the relationships we share with brothers and sisters in the faith may be reassuring and supportive. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those among us who endure struggles of mind, body, and spirit, that Christ who reaches out with healing for the nations may bring them peace and wholeness Surround them with compassionate caregivers and gifted healers, and give them patience through their struggle. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those for whom the challenges of this life have ended, and who now rest in the Lord, that light eternal might shine upon them, and that those who mourn might know the consolation of the Holy Spirit and the enduring hope of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving the ministries of all the saints and apostles, especially St. James and Saints Mary, Martha, and Lazarus of Bethany, that they were inspired to follow Jesus and open their lives and their homes to him. May we too receive his call with gratitude and like them to conform our lives to his. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercies through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also, and also with you. Share a sign of peace with one another, if you would. Peace with you. Friends, I invite you to rise as we pray together. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> Merciful God, you are most holy. Great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again. We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine so that we and all who share in the body and the blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people and given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Deliver us from evil, 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Let's say this, we are called to his supper. to receive you. But only seek the word and I shall be given. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated.
you please rise as you are able. May the blessing of Almighty God and these gifts of his Son's body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us unto everlasting life. Amen. Amen. We pray together. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you, being gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you in favor and bring you in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sure. 